we've been teaching on overcoming, and God, matter of fact, last week we talked on overcoming um, fear with faith, you know, but, and uh, tonight we're going to be over talking about overcoming temptation with the scripture, because God has given us the tools we need to be an overcomer, and to live for God, you got to overcome. Matter of fact, the Bible says he that uh, overcometh, thank God, is going to receive a crown of life, and so that's what it's all about is being able to finish as an overcomer. And, of course, um, temptation, uh, that is, the, the, uh, in living for God, is overcoming temptation. That's really the, the secret in being able to live for God is learning how to overcome temptation. So the best way to uh, overcome temptation is just to avoid it. He's got, and I wish there was a way that you could avoid all temptation. But the truth is, is it's not always possible to avoid temptation because it is all around us, and our day, uh, today lies, things just happen, and we're tempted to, to say the wrong thing, to do the wrong thing, and so uh, we have to just have uh, direction as how to overcome temptation. Despite all of our cares uh, and um, troubles, you know, that come against us, that cause us to have uh, places where that we feel struggles at, uh, it, it's just... Um, you know, a lot of times we just have to remind ourselves it's just a part of life. Now, temptation is not sin, and we want to really keep that in mind, but it is the yielding to temptation that is sin. And the Bible says uh, when lust has, or temptation has conceived, it brings forth sin. And so the key is learning how to avoid or how to overcome temptation. I got a read a story about a high school championship game that was going on, and I felt like it was a good example of of someone that really, more than one person, that overcame the temptation to do the wrong thing. Uh, of course, you know, being uh, enjoying sports and being a competitive person, uh, as I read this story, it just was so emotional to me. And so I finally realized I'm not going to be able to do this story. So I asked Stan if, if he would do this story so that, um, you know, I don't want to be a big titty baby up here. So I'm going to let him do it. And some of you, it may not affect you that way. But anyway, God bless. Basketball referee Al Cavino was officiating a high school league championship game in New Rochelle, New York. New Rochelle was the home team coached by Dan O'Brien. Their opponent was Yonkers. The game was back and forth nail-biter, and as the clock ticked down to 30 seconds, Yonkers led by one point. Yonkers shot and missed. New Rochelle grabbed the rebound and passed the ball up the court. The roar of the crowd was deafening as the New Rochelle player shot for the basket. The ball rolled tantalizingly around the rim and fell off. A teammate recovered it and quickly tapped it in for an apparent victory. The home crowd went wild. Referee Cavino looked at the clock and saw that time had expired, but he couldn't affirm New Rochelle's final basket because the crowd noise had prevented him from hearing the buzzer. He checked with, the, uh, with another official, but he hadn't heard it either. Cavino approached the timekeeper. A boy of 17 gazed up him with a long, sad face and said, Mr. Cavino, the buzzer went off as the ball rolled off the rim before the final tap was made. Cavino had no choice but to tell Coach O'Brien that he had lost the championship game. The coach was crestfallen. His face clouded over and his head drooped. At, the moment, at that moment, the young timekeeper came up to him and said, I'm sorry, Dad. I had to tell Mr. Cavino that time had ran out before the final basket. O'Brien looked up at his son. The cloud passed from his face, and he brightened as if the sun had burst through. That's okay, son, he said. You did what you had to do, and I'm proud of you. The coach turned to Cavino and said proud, proudly, Al, I want you to meet my son, Joe. Then the two walked off the court, the father and the son standing tall with his arm around his son's shoulders. Can you imagine the temptations that that boy had to fight? It was his own school's championship game. He was the son of the coach. Only he knew the buzzer had sounded before the final basket. He held in his hands the key to the culmination of the team's entire successful season. It would have been very easy to yield to the temptation and say the buzzer had sounded after that last shot instead of before. No one would have known the difference. There was also another potential temptation, the coach's temptation to win at any cost. O'Brien could have said, son, how could you do this to me, to your team, to your school? You let us all down. But neither father nor son yielded to these temptations, and I think we can see why. It's apparent in the pride of the father that the father showed in his son's integrity. The boy had been taught, taught to do right, the right thing. Because of that, they lost the game but achieved a much bigger victory that day.
Praise God. Thank God. And, and I think that's a great illustration of how that forceful temptation can be at times. You know, temptation can really uh, seem like the, the best thing to do, even though it's not the right thing to do. And many of you men face those type of temptations often on your jobs and other situations. And so uh, that's what we want you to understand of how important it is in those moments to, to overcome. And that is what uh, you call overcoming temptation by the uh, son and by his dad. And so many times we can put ourselves in all of those situations and just realize that temptation is uh, the lure of attraction. Thank God. It's, it's the pull towards pleasure, the, the sensual of the uh, will of, to abandon what we know is right, to indulge in that act of, for the moment and that seems immediately satisfying, but we know is sin. Ever since the fall uh, in the garden, uh, temptation has been the, the primary uh, factor leading men and women away from God because we yield to temptation. Temptation uh, affects everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. It doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible God, or how committed you are to doing the right thing. We all are tempted. And so uh, to overcome temptation, we must, uh, you know, continually be on our guard. We must continually be... Um, alert because temptation comes at the most uh, opportune times. And, and sin ha has never been uh, as accessible as it is today. Thank God. Evil ha has never been so uh, easily, so user-friendly, I guess you should say. They tell me that about that computer, too, that, you know, oh, this is all user-friendly. Well, it, it, it's, it's not friendly to me, but I'm glad it's friendly to somebody because they can say that about it. But the truth of the matter is sin has become so user-friendly friendly, and how um, you recognize it just at your fingertip in just a, a, a matter of a, a moment, uh, you can click on something and find yourself in a great temptation. And so today, temptation has a capital T. It's everywhere. It's not only in uh, open sin, but it's also in the daily lives that we live, the uh, irritations that life brings, the anxieties that life brings, the temptation to let our tongue slip. And so often we overcome the big temptations only to yield to some small one uh, like uh, anger or like um, just uh, getting uh, the last word in a, a family discussion. Often it is the, the little foxes that really spoil the vine. Um, you know, the temptation is not like a rattlesnake. If you see a rattlesnake, if you hear a rattlesnake, you immediately know that, hey, I need to get out of this place. You know, I need to flee. I need to be alert. Thank God. But temptation is more like a piece of chocolate cake or maybe like a $100 bill that is just uh, laying there that nobody would know that you had taken or a beautiful woman or a handsome man or a new Lexus or a chance to see uh, the answers to the exam. Uh, those are, you know, temptation is, is attractive. Thank God or it would not be temptation. It always um, uh, presents itself as, as something beautiful, as something to be desired, as something that we would, uh, that's inviting, and sometimes that is um, the danger. It always looks good, and it seems it would be so good for you to be able to indulge in that. Uh, so the, the first um, piece of advice about temptation is don't uh, walk away from it, but run away from it. Thank God. The Bible says to flee youthful lust. You know, you have to flee sin. You can't just uh, casually walk away from sin. And so when you know uh, you are weak in some area and things, you need to stay away from that place and that situation uh, so that you won't even have to deal with that temptation. Uh, don't let yourself get uh, set up because always the devil is trying to set us up. You know, that's the... Temptation is all about. It's a setup to try to get you to compromise or to indulge in something that you know that is not good because as long as you live, you're going to be tempted. And so remember, whatever tempts you, temptation you're going through, you're not the only one going through that. You're not the only person that's having to deal 
with that type of temptation. And so um, the, the, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is in your notes there. The first scripture reading we're going to do, Brother Sullivan. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Praise God. And so here, you know, Paul is just kind of, and in their time, uh, idolatry was a big temptation because all of the people around you worshipped idols and things. And so, you know, he says to, to flee uh, that. And um, also, uh, it's interesting to, to note that uh, God will never tempt you above what you're able. And so whenever you're having a, a hard temptation, you need to understand that God has confidence in you that you can overcome this. Obviously, we can fail, but it's not because we weren't able to overcome it. So God is never going to put more on you than you can bear. He's never going to uh, make a, a temptation come your way that you're not able to endure it. A lot of people, when they look at this and it says he's going to make a way of escape, you know, they're waiting for the helicopter to come. They're waiting for the Lord to just rapture them out of that situation. But really, the way of escape is that he is going to make you able to bear it. He's going to make you able to handle it. If you will reach out to him, if you'll cry out to the Lord, he will give you the strength and give you the help that you can overcome it. Even Jesus was tempted. So don't think that uh, some way you're going to get so good that you won't be able to be tempted. And that's the danger uh, is to think that you can uh, stand because the Bible says be careful because that's when you're more apt to fail when you get too confident in things. Matter of fact, the Hebrews chapter 4 it goes on to say this. Seeing then that we have a high, great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Praise God. And verse number 14 can be a kind of a tricky verse because it's double negatives there. And really and truly, it could just read, uh, you know, we have a high priest, you know, that can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. That's really what that's saying. Every double negative cancels out the negative. And so he's really saying we have a high priest that can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so he is our example. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace and we can say, Lord, I've got this temptation. It's really about to eat my lunch. I need you to help me with it. I got to and he can understand that. You know, we, if we're not careful, we can put God way up there and us way down here. But the truth is God has come down here. That's what we talk, preached about Sunday morning. You know, God became flesh so that he could be our uh, mediator, so that he could be our high priest, so that he could be our sacrifice for our sins. And so he took our place. He became a sin for us. And so we have uh, a high priest that can be touched by the feelings of our just thank God in verse number 18 went on to say for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted praise God and so he's able to comfort you in your temptation so don't be afraid to to let him know that that you need help to overcome whatever you're going through so let's just kind of look at uh, overcoming temptation and now we know he has promised that us a way of escape but sometimes it's not easy to find sometimes it's uh, by holding fast and so uh, the, the closer we stay to Jesus definitely the easier it is to overcome temptation and so if you want to have uh, the best chance of overcoming temptation is get as close to God as you can and it definitely will make a difference now again we can go back to uh, the armor that God has given to us to find help. Thank God, all the armor was designed to protect us to, uh, against an attack from the enemy. But there is also a piece of armor that was given to us to be on the offensive. And so God doesn't want you just to be hunkered down. Thank God he gave us a weapon so that we can be on the offensive. And that is the sword of the Spirit 
which is the Word of God. And of course, what we want to teach about tonight is overcoming temptation with Scripture and how that the Word of God can really be the best thing that you can have when you're being tempted. If you'll get the Word of God in your heart, it will help you to overcome against everything that the enemy throws at you. And so note, it's the Word of God, but we will see how to, to use the Word of God and how to overcome temptation. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. In other words, if you get enough of the Word of God in you, when sin comes at you, there's something inside that just won't let you do that because uh, you have the Word of God in your heart. And so that's um, the beautiful part about having His Word in in our heart. And um, there are two um, Greek words for for the Word of God. One is the logos, and that is uh, the entire Word of God. That's all of the the Bible. Thank God. The other word is the Rima. And of course, the, the Rima is when God speaks a word to us or when the Word of God just kind of uh, jumps out off of the pages and begins to touch our hearts and things. And, and that is um, a, 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 the Rima of God's Word. And so there's two ways that uh, the Word, when we're reading the Bible and it says the Word of God, um, it's two different words that can be translated there. And so in, in the Greek, uh, at times it's the logos of God, at times it's the word of God. But when it's talking about the, the sword of the spirit, it's talking about the rhema of God. It's talking about this word, like God gives you a word so that you can overcome whatever it is that's coming against you. And so the word can come from a brother, it can come from a sister, it can come from a, a message that's being preached, it can come from uh, the word of God being quickened back to your mind. But when you're in the, the battle with temptation, you need the, the, the word of the Spirit. You need the rhema. You need God to speak to you so that you can't overcome. And the Bible is that lamp unto our feet, and it's that light unto our paths. One man said it like this. I'd ask Brother Sullivan, and it's in your notes here that he's going to share this with you. I think. <laughs> yes, sir. He's got both cellars. Does mic go off? It might have got cut off on us. Yeah. Yes, you guess. Yes. Sometimes when you're reading a passage of Scripture, the words seem suddenly to come alive, take on flesh and bones, and leap off the page at you, or grow eyes that follow you around everywhere you go, or develop a voice that echoes in your ears until you can't get away from it. This is the rhema of God, a saying of God that strike home like an arrow to the heart. This is the word of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's the beautiful part about the word of God. And Jesus showed us, you know, how to use the word of God in Scripture in overcoming temptation. And, and right after uh, Jesus' baptism, the, the voice came, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The dove appeared, and it was a, a very uh, spectacular moment that he was declared the son of God. Thank God. And he was, um, but uh, just from that place, thank God, he went from having this tremendous experience to being driven of the spirit into the wilderness. And this type of temptation is what they call the, the, the Matterhorn Syndrome. And, of course, the Matterhorn is a 14,000-foot mountain in the Alps that um, many people, uh, it's a great challenge mountain. Uh, I mean, it's not for the uh, amateur mountain climber, but uh, it's a great uh, challenge for mountain climbers. And they have found that many have died on that mountain, uh, and they're at the foot of it. There's a cemetery. But the amazing thing is, is that most of the people that lie in that cemetery that uh, died on that mountain, it was not while they were ascending the mountain, but it was when they started descending the mountain. They had got the exhilaration of standing on top of the Matterhorn, that they had conquered that mountain, and on their way down, they became careless, and that's when they actually lost. And so they call it the Matterhorn Syndrome. 
Uh, and that's also what can happen with us in our spiritual walk with God. Sometimes after your greatest victories in the Lord, you have to be careful how you unwind off of that victory because in that moment of just uh, relaxing and just saying, hey, I made it, I had this great victory, that's when you are the most vulnerable to uh, allow a little fox to slip up beside you and cause you to, to fail and to lose out with God. And there are, you know, so that spiritually that can happen after you've had a, a great victory. There's only three ways that the devil can tempt you. Some of you said, oh, no, he tempts me about a million ways. There's all kind of ways he tempts me. But uh, really and truly, thank God the Bible says it like this in 1 John 2 and 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Praise God. And so all that's in the world, there's just three ways that you can be tempted. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. They can put a lot of different clothes on it. It can have a lot of different uh, makeups and things. But when you boil every temptation down, it's either the lust of your flesh, it's either the lust of your eye, or it's the pride of life. And sometimes it can be all of them involved in one temptation. But, uh, and it was Satan's strategy in the garden. The Bible says that, you know, uh, they, they saw that it was good for food. Thank God. And that was the lust of the eye. They saw that it, well, they saw that it was good for food. That was the lust of the flesh. They saw that it was good to the eye, it, pleasant to look upon. And that was the lust of the eye. And then the pride of life, it'll make you like God. It'll make you wise. Thank God. And so uh, in Matthew, Jesus shows us how to overcome all three of these temptations. And he is our great example. And he's and so in temptation, he even shows us how to overcome. The first way that Jesus was tempted was with the lust of the flesh. The Bible says this in verse uh, number 1, or chapter 4, verse number 1. Then when Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and we had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Praise God. And the thing you always want to remember about the devil, when he tempts you, it's going to be something that you're capable of doing. And he knew that Jesus Christ was capable of making those stones into bread because he spoke the worlds into existence. And got in later on, you know, he'll do the miracle of the 5,000 where that he takes uh, five loaves and two fishes and feeds 5,000 people. So it was not that Jesus, uh, Jesus was very capable of doing that, but also Jesus realized that it was a temptation for him to use his power. And so in verse number four, this is how that Jesus overcame him. And the amazing thing is, is that Jesus is trying to be our example. And he wants us to understand this is the way that you can overcome the devil, the same way that he overcame the devil. And so he says it like this. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He's got it. And so he took that sword of the word. Thank God. And I'm telling you, that's why it's so important to get the word of God in your heart. He took the word of God and he said, but it's written, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of mouth. The second way that the enemy tempted Jesus was the lust of the eye. And so here's his next temptation, overcoming the lust of the eye, verses 4 and 5. Or five and the and devil six. taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Praise God. And so he tempts Jesus to do something spectacular that Jesus could do. And matter of fact, the devil even quoted a little scripture. Thank God. And so just because, um, you know, the Bible says he can transform himself into an angel of light. So just because somebody quotes you a scripture doesn't mean that necessarily uh, that is really what the Word of God means. You know, you've got to be careful of how you let the Word of God be um, used to, to give you uh, license to do something that deep down we know that uh, is against what the Word of God teaches. And so the devil quoted scripture to him, thank God, and... Um, you know, I've heard it said that you can so twist the scriptures that you can get it to say anything you want it to say if you just want to uh, piecemeal enough verses together. But again, Jesus shows us the power of, of having the word of God, uh, the sword of the spirit, to defeat the devil. And he said in verse number 7, 
Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Praise God. And I know that, uh, you know, tempting the Lord is uh, the thing that uh, Satan was trying to get Jesus just to be doing something spectacular. I always like to say this to people when I'm teaching to them about the temptations. You know, if you go out here and get on a railroad track and a train's coming and you start rebuking that train in the name of Jesus just to prove that you had the power to stop that train, probably you're just going to be a little greasy spot. You know, that's not what he wants us to do. And so we're not to tempt the Lord, you know. Uh, it is kind of like the professor, you know, that was trying to prove to the kids that there was no God. And he just said, you know, if there's a God, you know, uh, I want him to just come and knock me off of this uh, platform where I'm teaching this class from today. And, and he said, I'm going to give God 10 minutes to come knock me off of this platform and just show y'all that there's no God because I'm telling him if he wants to, he can just knock me off of this platform. Thank God. But there was a big football player walking down the hall, and he heard what that professor was saying. Thank God. And so the next thing the professor knew, he was laying flat on the floor, and he was wondering, he said, what in the world? He said, he got up and said, why did you do that? So the Lord was too busy, and he sent me. Praise God. (laughs) So, you know, I don't want to take any chances. There might be a football player walking around somewhere. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. And and that's what uh, Jesus was telling us. But if you get in a situation and you do need an emergency and your car car does stall on a railroad track, you can ask the Lord to help you. And he may give you the, the wisdom to jump out of your car before the train gets there. Or he may cause a train to stop before it hits your car. I mean, you can call on his name. And some of you know that because you've been almost in a wreck. And you just said, Jesus, and something just miraculously happened. And the wreck didn't happen. And it should have happened, but it didn't happen. And God can miraculously deliver us if we are in distress. But we don't just go around trying to prove that he can deliver us either. And so the third temptation was, was a pride of life, verse number 8 and 9. Well, I think we got cut off again. <laughs> that little button must not be your friend. Oh, oh it's red now, so that, that's a... Well, let's grab this mic here, Brother Sullivan. Brother Mike, do you think you can find us? Yeah, we've already found him. Okay, yeah, it's just a battery problem now. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Praise God. And of course, the devil is the ruler of the world because Adam gave up the dominion. God gave man dominion over the earth. But when Adam sinned, he gave up that dominion. The devil stole the dominion that we have upon this earth. And of course, um, that's when, so the devil is just saying, that, You know, you won't have to do all the things that you're going to plan to do. I can just give you all the kingdom of the world if you'll just fall down and worship me. And again, Jesus used the sword of the Spirit, uh, the word of God, to resist the devil. And he said in verse number 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Praise God. And note of what happened when Jesus resisted the devil, because this is what he promised us, that if we would resist the devil. But verse number 11 says, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Thank God. And that is always what happens. When you overcome a temptation uh, and you finally get the victory, suddenly it's just like a, a wonderful blessing comes that you made it and you overcame. It's a wonderful thing. And it's what, you know, the Word of God promised us in uh, James chapter 7 and 8. It says this to us. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Praise God. And so if we'll submit ourselves to God, thank God, and resist the devil, he will flee from us. And so we, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, I don't have to put up with this. Praise God. I don't have to put up with being uh, uh, hindered and being tormented by the devil. I can start resisting this, and in the name of Jesus, he has to flee. Thank God. He doesn't, you know, again... Uh, if whatever's troubling you, uh, if somebody's bothering you and things, if, they're, if it's the devil in them making them bother you, you can rebuke the devil in them and they'll leave you alone. Thank God, if it's the flesh in them bothering you, thank God, well, you know, flesh is a lot harder to deal with than the devil because the devil, you know, we have power over the devil. 
but flesh is something that we can only uh, get righteous and we can just try to help it to get saved and we can try to help it to repent. And so uh, flesh and the devil are two different things that we have to deal with from time to time. So the key is getting the Word of God in your heart, uh, God. And so when the devil comes, that you can just use the Word of God on him. And because uh, the Word of God has power, the, the devil has to respond to the command of the Word of God. And, and one of the best ways to get the Word of God in your heart is to remem- memorize Scripture. Thank God. Memorize the Word of God. So when you need the Word of God, you don't have to run and try to find your Bible. Praise God, you just are able, the Spirit's just able to quicken it to you. I don't know if you've ever been in situations where that you needed a word, you needed to help someone. Maybe they were asking you a question. Maybe there was a, a need that you had to know what, how to overcome or something, and suddenly something you had studied, something you had read just comes to mind, and you just start quoting a scripture. You just realize, wow, that's because I had that in my heart. I wasn't thinking what to say to this person, and then suddenly God just brings the scripture to mind. That, oh, yeah, that's, that's a scripture that would help that person. And that's why if you get the word in your heart, then God can quicken it back to you so that it can be your help to you. Thank God we have these promises in the Bible. First, uh, Psalms 119.11 says this, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Praise God. And that's the power of the word. If you get enough of the word of God in you, it will help you to keep you from sinning. We went on to say in verse number 16, you know, Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. I think it's 174 verses, whatever it is. And um, so, uh, but in that long chapter, there are some wonderful truths. And verse number 16 is one of those. I will delight myself in thy statute. I will not forget thy word. Praise God. And so the psalmist is just talking about how uh, wonderful the Word of God is. He says, I delight myself in the Word of God. Thank God. And I'm not going to forget uh, thy word. And then in verse number 24, he said this. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Praise God. And, and you know, the Word of God, uh, the word delight is used 50 times in the Bible. And many of those times it's concerning the Word of God, being delighted in the Word of God. Praise God. Let's stand. Time's uh, wrapping up here, and um, and so I want to kind of learn what the the psalmist had learned when he said uh, in Psalms 40 and 8, he said this, okay, I delight myself in the law of the Lord, thank God, and within my heart, praise God. In other words, he says, I delight myself in the Lord, in the law of God that's in my heart. He's got beyond duty, you know, is delight. You know, we know it's our duty to do the right thing, but sometimes uh, duty is, is kind of hard to do. But when we fall in love with the Lord and we begin to live because we delight ourselves in the Lord, thank God, it's easy to do your duty when you are delighted to have the opportunity to do it. There is a joy when we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength of just doing what pleases Him. And that's kind of what happens, has to happen to a person when they repent of their sins, they have to fall in love with the Lord. When you fall in love with Him, you know, it's a delight to do His will. Thank God, when you let Jesus Christ take control of your life, thank God, you become a new creature. You, you become a new creation. You have a new heart. You have new desires. Praise God, because he gives you righteousness, he gives you peace, he gives you joy, and all of that comes by just a relationship with God. Thank God, if you're needing peace, if you're needing joy, thank God, it comes with just making peace with God. And as you have peace with God, thank God, all of the benefits of God begin to come to you. And so tonight, all of us have something to be thankful for. Thank God, I think it'd be good for us just to lift our hands and just thank him because he has brought us into his presence, God, because you are worthy as you know our situations and can help us to be an overcomer, can help us to rise above every situation that would come against us here tonight. God, I know that there are needs in this building that only you can meet. I do understand every heart, understand every crime, you know where needs are at here tonight. I plead your blood for every soul that's here tonight. Thank God. I praise you. I worship you today. Thank God. You know, the Lord knows what's going on in your life. He knows where you're, you're really struggling at tonight. You may have walked in here and put a smile on your face, but deep down there's something that's going on in your life that you know that I need God to help. I need God to touch. Thank God, I'm telling you, in a moment he can do that. Praise God. I wouldn't want anyone to leave here tonight without being able to have that opportunity to just kind of reach out and 
touch the Lord for whatever needs you may have in your life. And so why don't we come around the altars for a few minutes, just give him some praise and give him some thanks. And maybe there's someone here tonight that just needs a touch. And while we're here together, thank God, there's something about worshiping together, praising together that just gives us a peace and a strength. And so let's just pray for one another for a few moments here. Uh, do you know every situation around these altars tonight? God, everyone that brought a need, everyone that brought a situation, God, I pray that somewhere through this service they've been strengthened. Pray that somewhere through this service they've been able to...